<laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Kathleen, who's our assistant director and, and Zoom guru, and Susie Thompson, who's our trustee who works on programs. Um, I, one of the good things, and probably the only good thing that came out of the pandemic is that the library has been able to get speakers of a quality that we could not have gotten before. People who were too far afield could not come, or we certainly couldn't afford to have them come. And Matt is one of these. And we have planned, we've had speakers continuously since by Zoom since the pandemic, pandemic began. And we have them scheduled all the way in through February. On Sunday, um, come over to the library. This is the one exception, of course, this Sunday where Laura Stinchfield is going to, she's a, an animal behaviorist. Some people call her a uh, pet psychic and she's going to be talking about animal behavior on the grounds of the library at four o'clock on Sunday. And it's a lovely, lovely place and she's fun and local. So come join her. Then we have somebody coming to talk about the salvaging of the documents, the Jewish treasures, manuscripts and books from the Vilna uh, ghetto in Lithuania. We have someone coming to talk about the race to translate the Rosetta Stone. We have somebody coming who makes book art. Um, and um, we have, um, anyway, lots of others that are coming as well. So look at our webpage and join us, please, for these programs. Now, this is great. Matt, thank you. Thanks, Heather. Thank you both. Um, Matt, you're very elusive online. When I went online trying to find something out about you, and I found this delightful um, interview that you had given with the Richmond Magazine. And <clears throat> it seems that you were at one point a professor of English with a background in creative writing. You've written for the Atlantic and for the Paris Review and I guess the Richmond Times, the Richmond Magazine. And this is your first book. And it has gotten great reviews, which is wonderful. It's hard to get published. The fact that you've got these wonderful reviews is very special. In fact, Publishers Weekly, um, Weekly called it a culinary romp through time and a delight to both foodies and to history buffs. Matt is going to be joined this evening by Heather Cassani Weintraub, who is a local resident now. She fled Brooklyn with her husband, Matthew, and their infant daughter, Julia, and their rabbit, Buster, um, from a tiny apartment in Brooklyn. And we know a lot of young people who've done that, up to North Salem and its beauties. Heather is a manuscripts and rare book specialist with Christie's. And she's known Matt since they were in high school and claims to have written all of his English homework when he was in high school. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to them and we're going to have questions probably at the end. So put your questions into the chat box. And Matt, Heather, go for it. Great. Thank you so much for the uh, nice introduction. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, it's great to be here talking to Matt. Um, I've had the pleasure of reading bits and pieces of this book as it came together over the past few years. Um, we can talk more about the process of writing later, but um, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, it's The Secret History of Food, uh, Strange But True Stories About the Origins of Everything That We Eat. Uh, it is really fun, uh, really wonderfully uh, well-written. Uh, it's a deep dive into the science and history of what we eat and why we eat it. Uh, Matt answers questions like, how did apple pie become something we think of as American? Uh, how did cereal become something that, you know, 90% of Americans eat for breakfast? Uh, is olive oil really Italian or is it even really olive oil? Uh, why do we like spicy foods? Um, every sentence in it is so meticulously researched that it could be a book in itself. And uh, from reading it, I feel like I'll have dinner party tidbits uh, for the rest of my life. Um, I can't compliment it enough, really. Um, it's like being assaulted by many, many facts, but in, in the best way possible. Um, it, it's just great. Um, so, so each chapter in the book takes on a common food. Uh, this is definitely a, a softball question to start, but, uh, but it's a serious one. Um, did you get hungry a lot writing this? Because yeah. it starts about pie and I've definitely been thinking about pie. 
Yeah, no, I, I did. I definitely got hungry uh, throughout and it, it took me, uh, you know, a, a few years to write all in. So there, there was a lot of eating. You know, my cravings tended to follow the chapter subjects. So I went through a cereal phase, an ice cream phase, a pie phase, uh, probably skipped the pepper chapter a little bit and just kept eating cereal. Uh, you know, also, I did a lot of my research in places like the Library of Congress, which uh, don't don't, I don't think you're allowed to eat there and you can't bring in a lot for security reasons. You have to use clear plastic bags. So yeah, I often found myself uh, just starving in archives and library basements, just reading about these dishes and these food, food descriptions and just getting so hungry from them. Wow, that's, yeah, that's great. Um, well, I mentioned pie. Um, and you talk about the origins of pie, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Um, the pie crust, you talk about pie crust and it's fascinating. Basically the first pies, the crust was inedible. It was called the coffin. Um, tell us, please tell us more about that. Yeah, you know, I think one of the, one of the more fascinating things uh, about pie that's just hard to wrap our head around um, is that originally the, the crust was not meant to be eaten. As you, as you mentioned, it was called quite appropriately the coffin and its sole purpose, it was really an economical way to keep everything together so that you could cook it. Um, and keep when it was this? When, when did pie have this inedible crust? Um, we're talking, you know, the first recipe for apple pie was around the 1300s. So that give or take a few hundred years. Um, really, it, you know, it, it was sort of an early version of aluminum foil or, or Tupperware, just an economical way to keep everything together for baking. And traditionally, it was thrown away uh, after eating. And it was also a lot thicker and harder than the crusts we see today. So you know, as you mentioned, we get into uh, whether or not pie, apple pie is American and pie in general and the lineage there. Technically it's not. So there are recipes for apple pie that uh, precede America by hundreds of years, but we made it American. And one of the biggest ways we did that is by literally stretching the crust to become flaky and thin. So, you know, the short story is colonists did this out of necessity. They they didn't have the luxury of throwing away food and, and they didn't have a, a ton of wheat to go around. So they were little, literally forced to stretch their crust. And, you know, the byproduct of that is it became not only uh, more edible, but more pleasing to eat. And, uh, you know, that was one of the, the key ways we transformed pie. And you can still see, you know, there are big differences between, you know, American pies and British pies today. Um. Yeah, I, I I was in uh, I was in Oxford several years ago on a business trip, and my husband insisted that I go to a place called the Pie Minister for a you know traditional British meat pie. It was okay. It was it was not my favorite thing, but um, the uh, so the crust were the crusts. Do you know like the ingredients of the old crusts that were so inedible? Was it the difference just that it was stretched? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was mostly wheat, you know, just, just thick, you know, almost if you've ever um, sort of baked a fish in salt, like a salt crust. Okay. You know, it was a very similar mechanism to that. Um, okay. Um, you actually, you start the book by talking about something that I personally found really interesting, which was the genetic prenatal, postnatal influences of, of what we eat and how that's predetermined. Um, I had heard that before and, uh, you know, I have a one-year-old daughter and, um, it, it, you know, I love spicy foods, which we'll talk about later because you have a wonderful chapter on spicy foods, but, um, you know, I had heard about sort of the, the prenatal influence and definitely ate spicy foods like a maniac, uh, when I was pregnant with the hopes of not having a picky kid. Um, it, it, what's the science behind this? Yeah, good luck. Uh, keep <laughs> us posted about uh, Julia's eating habits. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into our eating habits. There's genetics, there's uh, psychology, there's experience. Um, you know, a lot of so-called picky eaters 
they, they're actually, they have physically uh, more, more taste buds. So they're actually born with more taste buds and they're more sensitive to bitter tastes, right? So things like uh, coffee. Is this the super tasters you were talking yeah. about, like non-tasters? Yeah. So, you know, our, uh, you know, we're all different, right? Our bodies are all different and we all have different genetics, um, things that are turned on and turned off. Um, but yeah, so a lot of people who are picky eaters, they're, they're classified as super tasters where a lot of foods taste super bitter to them that might not taste bitter to us. Uh, cilantro is another example. Cilantro is a, is a very divisive food to some people. It tastes wonderful to other people. They say it tastes exactly like soap and that's, that's purely genetics. Um, but as I mentioned, there's also psychology, there's experience, and there, there is a lot of research that shows that um, children are impacted by flavors that are picked up by a mother's uh, amniotic fluid and breast milk, and that those flavors go on to uh, influence them well into adulthood. So there are definitely studies that show that as you're doing, uh, children who are breastfed tend to be more adventurous eaters. The basic theory being there that they're exposed to a greater variety of flavors early on versus, you know, a, a formula that, that stays the same. Um, and then, you know, a lot of these tastes, uh, they, a lot of the tastes that they experience early on, they tend to, you know, they stay with us. So, you know, a lot of those early comfort foods, you know, we associate with childhood and that childhood goes back, you know, in some cases all the way to the womb. Um, I wasn't going to get to comfort foods until later, but I think since you, since you brought it up, um, you spend a lot of time, uh, talking about, talking about ice cream and, uh, how its popularity grew around prohibition and the great depression and how Rocky road became a metaphor. Um, it, tell us more, tell us more about ice cream. I know it's a, it's a favorite topic here. Yeah, ice cream is interesting. You know, ice cream has sort of always been a really sought after f comfort food. You know, foods are comforting for a lot of reasons um, and sought after for a lot of reasons. The appeal of ice cream, you know, early on, I mean, before things like refrigeration, a, a big appeal of it was that it was cooling and that it was so different um, and also that it was so scarce, right? Like you couldn't, like today, you couldn't just go downstairs to your fridge and open up ice cream. Um, a lot of cases you had to wait for winter to come around and wait for a storm in winter and then go get snow or go get ice or climb mountains and, and bring things down. So, you know, early on, a lot of the comfort was, was due to its, its seasonality. Um, you mentioned prohibition, you know, ice cream took a while to take off. And that's because even up to, up until, you know, relatively recently, it, it still was pretty hard to make. And, you know, you think about refrigeration, yeah. those are all, you know, pretty, pretty recent, you know, things in the, in the scope of humanity. Um, but yeah, prohibition boosted, uh, was a huge boost to ice cream. A lot of early American breweries uh, during prohibition pivoted from making beer to making soda and ice cream. Yeah. The stats that you have in the book are just, they're amazing. Like just the many, many gallons of ice cream that people started consuming. It, it, it grew, ice cream consumption grew exponentially during uh, prohibition. And, you know, a lot of that was because of those American breweries, you know, for, for one of the reasons they pivoted, um, you know, sort of logistically, they had the equipment, right? So they had, you know, the supply chain, they had the bottling and the refrigeration, but also, you know, the business they were in was providing comfort and escape from reality. And during Prohibition, ice cream really stood in for alcohol as, you know, something to drown our emotions in. I wonder yeah. what has happened with uh, ice cream consumption in the past year and a half, actually. You know, it would be, it would be interesting, but yeah, I would, uh, I would say the odds are that it's gone up, it's gone up exponentially, you know. I know it up. has in our household, but. Uh... Big time. So uh, yeah, the, you know, the, uh, the Great Depression was another, you know, all these, all these pivotal points, the Great Depression, you know, um, 
also impacted things. You mentioned Rocky Road. You know, today we think of Rocky Road as just, you know, sort of another name, but it, it was initially, it was, it was a metaphor. You know, it was created during the Great Depression as, you know, a, a, an ice cream to, to cheer people up and remind them that things could still be, you know, still be sweet and enjoyable amidst all the rocky roads out there, you know, in those hard times. And then finally, war, uh, you know, war also, you know, World War II was, was huge in boosting ice cream. And, you know, the American military <laughs> played, played a very pivotal role in boosting ice cream. Again, ice cream was nothing, nowhere near as ubiquitous as it is today in, in the 1940s. And part of the reason um, it became so ubiquitous is the, the effort by uh, the United States military to, to make sure that every soldier overseas had as much ice cream as possible to really give them you know, some comfort and remind them what they were fighting for. The cost of that had to be crazy. I mean, just the refrigeration. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it was, it, it, it was unreal. I mean, they, you know, we literally had an ice cream barge that just trolled the Pacific delivering ice cream to ships. Uh, there were, you know, literally delivering cartons of ice cream to foxholes. Um, you know, a, a lot of times I will say they probably did save some money. A lot of times it was a de dehydrated ice cream mix, right? So, you know, they were shipping, they were shipping that, that mix and then, you know, on the ground they would make it. But yeah, that barge, uh, that they spent a million dollars, over a million dollars on that barge. And that was the 1940s. Um, so yeah, it was, it was super expensive. And, and where does Howard Johnson come into all of this? Yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot. I really could have written the book just exclusively on ice cream. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of those soldiers who came home, uh, you know, they, they fondly remembered eating ice cream in camps and overseas. And that was, uh, that was part of the post-war boom. And you combine that with, uh, with the burgeoning highway system across the country and, yeah, Howard Johnson, he, he was a vet. So he came home and uh, he purchased a drugstore and uh, started selling ice cream uh, out of that drugstore. Ironically, uh, a recipe that he bought from a German, <laughs> from a German vendor. Um, and his ice cream was so popular that uh, it, before long he was selling you know, the bulk of the money from his drugstore was coming from the ice cream counter. And so he really pivoted, you know, just embraced ice cream altogether and uh, put these Howard Johnson locations all across the country, really strategically placing them along the expanding highway and turnpike system. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't really think Howard Johnson's is certainly not the, ho the household name anymore, but at one point it was the, uh, I think the largest and fastest growing food chain in the country. And I have stats in the books that I, that I would have to look at in terms of how often yeah. they were opening. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was crazy. There was definitely a, uh, a big boom during the Great Depression and post-World War II. You start to talk about food and war in the book, and there are just some things that really jumped out at me is just crazy, uh, like war pigs and beehives over castle walls, uh, water supply contamination. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, food, uh, food has been weaponized since antiquity. Um, so yeah, if you go way back to, you know, the earliest days, My uh, cavemen were, were literally, you know, they would throw beehives, you know, into, uh, into, into caves. Right. Um, and that, that continued, you know, so you've got things like, uh, you know, even if you think about, uh, during the medieval period, things like castle sieges, uh, beehives were, you know, a, one of the ways you could defend against sieges was by dropping a beehive <laughs> over the wall or from the reverse by catapulting it into over the wall into into a castle or a village. 
Uh, you've also got things like hot cooking oil that you can, you know, use to throw at people and uh, all sorts of, you know, poisoning foods and destroying your enemy's crops and poisoning enemy wells. I mean, history, the history of using food as a weapon, unfortunately, is, uh, again, another subject we could have written an entire book on. Um, and that even goes to in modern times. So, you know, World War II, um, the United States actually created a fat salvage committee to collect used cooking oil, used cooking fats from kitchens and turn them into explosives. So, and uh, I think they turned coconuts and I think it was almond shells into charcoal filters for gas masks. So, you know, a lot of ways food was used as sort of a natural resource for war. Um, but, you know, World War II, I, I think what's most interesting about that to me is that was really the first big modern effort to think about food, uh, not just in terms of a weapon and calories for feeding uh, troops, but in terms of, you know, thinking about food for comfort and for morale. Yeah. Um, well, changing gears a little bit, um, I, I said earlier, I wanted to hear more about the spicy foods. Um, I was surprised that you mentioned birds at the beginning of that chapter. Um, we, we haven't owned a home for a long time, but, uh, my, uh, we have a bird feeder and my husband mixes, uh, mixes pepper with the, with the seed because it keeps the squirrels away. Um, and why, why does this work? And just tell us about spicy food. Yeah. So this is actually, you know, oddly a great segue from war and weapons. So if you think about how humans use pepper spray as a defense mechanism, uh, plants basically do the same thing. I mean, that's, that's what peppers are. So uh, the reason that peppers are hot is to deter seed destroying predators. So when humans and most other animals eat a pepper and they chew it, they crush the seeds and they destroy the seeds and you know, the, the plant can't spread and propagate. So as a defense mechanism from that to, you know, preserve their, you know, to preserve uh, the plants, preserve themselves, they, uh, they developed capsaicin to deter really, you know, as a chemical defense mechanism to deter predators. And uh, what's interesting is while, you know, so we are seed destroyers, birds are seed dispersers. So birds swallow seeds whole and they uh, excrete and spread them all over the place with natural fertilizer. And actually some interesting things happen in their digest digestive tracts that help protect the seeds. But the bottom line is uh, humans and mammals are, are bad for seeds when we eat them and birds are beneficial. And a biological reward of that is birds are immune to capsaicin. So, um, if you, yeah, if, if you, they have these things called, they have capsaicin infused bird seed. I spent a while, by the way, trying to figure out how to say that when I was reading it. So thank you. But, you know, I, I feel really bad for my audiobook reader who was amazing, but there's so many words that are, you know, just foreign terms in there and antiquated terms, very confused things that I'm glad I didn't have to try and pronounce. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when you, when you put capsaicin and infused bird seed in your bird feeder, the birds have no idea it's there, you know, uh, it does nothing to them. And the squirrels like, like us, um, they, they sense it as a burning pain. And, you know, what's ironic is that humans are the only animal that seeks out the pain of hot peppers. And I think that says a lot about humanity and our stubbornness and our psychology Every other animal out there, they're, they're deterred by capsaicin. And it's not just used, you know, uh, the birds and pepper spray, it, birds and uh, uh, squirrels is a great example, but all throughout history, there, there's a ton of examples. Even today, you know, there are ranchers who plant pepper crops around their other crops to keep things like elephants away from their crops. Yeah, I read that, so that's interesting. It, it works to deter uh, 
every animal except for humans and birds. I thought of that today. I actually had a very spicy sandwich for lunch and I was sort of, I was sweating. My nose was running and I was like, yeah, why do we do this? It just, it tastes really good. Um, but you talk about how hotter climates have increased, uh, you know, increased use of spicy food. Yeah. So there's a, you know, there's no logical reason for, for humans to eat, uh, to eat hot peppers. Right. Um, some people like you clearly love the feeling and, and there's a reason for that. You know, I also know, I happen to know that you're a runner um, and, you know, the mechanism uh, of basically what happens to your body when you run and eat a hot pepper, uh, <laughs> they're both basically fight or flight mechanisms. So, you know, it, the, the uh, when you eat hot peppers, they release chemicals very similar to a runner's high. And, you know, some people really enjoy that. Um, so there are all these, these sort of little reasons that compound in terms of why we took an interest in spicy foods. Um, one of them is, yeah, in, in hotter climates, uh, foods tend to be spicier, um, but foods also tend to use more spices in general. Um, there are a few reasons for that. If you think about, you know, prior to refrigeration in a hotter climate, it's a lot more difficult to keep foods, particularly meats fresh. Um, and, you know, spices can have an, an antibacterial effect on meat and they can, you know, the more spices you add, you know, different spices are more potent, but they can help keep food uh, fresher and keep it from going bad. And if it does go bad, they can also sort of mask the taste and scent of foods that aren't the freshest. So yeah. that's one of the reasons um, that spices, you know, initially had some utility. There's also just the, the peacocking bravado and, and masculinity is another reason you think about, you know, hot wing challenges, you know. Um, so there are theories that, you know, and I think this is something you can see today is, you know, people eating peppers as, you know, a, a, a way to, to showcase their masculinity and say, hey, I'm strong, I'm tough, I can, I can protect you. So sort of a, a mating ritual. So there are a lot of interesting reasons. Interesting. Um, do we know what the, like, what the spiciest, you know, food or pepper is? Like, is there? Yeah, so it changes probably every year or two, or, you know, it, it changes pretty often because we are bent as a species on, on uh, engineering these peppers to be hotter and hotter. Um, so there's, you know, just like you can crossbreed, um, you know, different apples to create different varieties of apples, or now they have these uh, cotton candy grapes that, you know, have been in the news. Oh, wait, no, I've missed this. What are they? <laughs> Uh, cotton candy grapes came out maybe a few years ago. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, a white grape that's supposed to taste like cotton candy. And uh, I completely the, good, miss this. the good news is it's, it's not, you know, they're not injecting, you know, sugar and flavor into these. It's just uh, someone was experimenting with grapes and they, they came across a, a certain breed that just tasted to them like cotton candy. Um, yeah, we're getting off on a tangent here, but it, it does, they do taste like cotton candy. For me, they're cloyingly sweet. I can eat, I can eat like one and, and I can't eat anymore. Oh, um, to check those out. But yeah, we, uh, you know, as a species, there are people who are uh, intent on playing around with foods and making them taste sweeter and, you know, making, you know, breeding them for size and sweetness and texture. And uh, there's a whole, you know, subgroup of people who, who are out to find the, to breed the hottest pepper out there and they're, they're getting hotter and hotter. Wow. Okay. I don't know if I'm quite ready for that yet. I, but... I, I, I'm not. I'm about at jalapeno level, which <laughs> isn't very hot. Um. Okay, so you have a chapter on tomatoes, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, and there's there's so much to talk about in there. Um, so first, people thought tomatoes were poisonous. When yeah. was this for 
it, it, tomatoes just seem so ubiquitous. Yeah, it's well, they so it's funny. So, so people used to think a lot of foods were poisonous, and there are a lot of different reasons for this. Um, so if we think about if we think about tomatoes or, or, or fruits in general, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if there's a plague going around, right, and you're washing your fruits and vegetables in the water, right, that, that water that, you know, you don't have a filtration system like we do today, you've got maybe some dead animals floating in the water and bathing and drinking in the water, um, and then you bring that fresh fruit home and vegetables home and, and eat them and you get sick. Well, you can see how some people would draw some conclusions to blame the tomatoes for making them sick. Um, so there were periods in time, you know, really, you know, there's a lot of ebbs and flows with food throughout history, right? Um, you've got a whole mix of different cultures and, you know, there's just a lot a lot going on, but throughout history, a lot of foods have been accused of or have been thought to be poisonous. Um, the the tomatoes and tomatoes an interesting one. Um, an, another theory. Well, uh, sorry, I'm rambling here, but that, so the the washing them in water is is a reason that actually made sense. But there's a lot of a lot of stuff that we uh, we don't really know why people came to these conclusions. So tomatoes were also associated with witchcraft. They were called the devil's apples. They were thought <laughs> to be used to summon werewolves. That made me laugh. Yeah. And uh, also, you know, they um, they uh, there were some rumors out there that they were guarded by these poisonous uh, worms that would spit venom at you and. Uh, and those turned out to be harmless, you know, little harmless caterpillars. Um, so we don't really know exactly how a lot of these things came about. Um, some of the time it had to do with looks. So I also write about potatoes. Um, potatoes, uh, people were afraid of potatoes for years and years. Um, and, you know, for a whole nother reason, people were afraid to eat potatoes mostly because of the way they looked. So that's sort of maybe easier to understand than the tomato. So, you know, if you think about a, a potato, it's got this sort of gnarled, nubby appearance, and that doesn't not look like certain diseases, right? So they, they were afraid that, hey, if I, eat a, if I eat a potato, that might make me look like that, right? <laughs> and that they thought that uh, they could cause things like leprosy and syphilis. Um, what's ironic is that the, the tomato and the potato uh, once both thought to be poisonous and really avoided uh, big time, they're the, the number one and number two vegetables in America by far today. So they've come a long way. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the potatoes road to uh, popularity? Yeah. So as with you know, a question people ask me a lot is like, hey, you know, who, who's the first one to decide to eat this food? And it's an interesting question, you know, to think about a lot of foods, right? Like oysters, milk, eggs. There's a lot of things that, it, you know, I don't know that I would have had the idea to, to eat these things if I hadn't seen other people eat them first. But, you know, the, the answer to all these things is, 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 uh, is usually the same. It's usually starvation. It's usually the threat of, of hunger. Um, so most of the foods that we that we that we avoided at first and ended up eating, we ate because we really didn't have any other choice. So what ended up making tomato uh, potatoes popular is that other crops failed, right? So. You know, other crops might have been susceptible to a certain disease that year or, you know, certain issues caused other crops to fail. And hey, the only thing uh, that seems to be growing this year or surviving this year is the potato. Well, we might as well give it a try. It's better than starving. And that's, you know, the short answer is that happened with, with a lot of foods out there. Yeah. And then, of course, being made into French fries. 
Yeah. So, you know, I, I mentioned that potatoes and tomatoes are the number one and number two uh, vegetable in the United States by far, by like a gigantic margin. And the reason for that is mostly due to the use of, uh, mostly due to their use in frozen French fries and um, tomato sauce in frozen pizza. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting to say the least. You start talking, I think it's in the tomato chapter um, about olive oil and fish. Two things that, you know, I usually think of as healthy and, and all the things that are wrong with them. Um, I'll let you maybe recap a little of that for everyone. But, um, but my question is going to be, are there, are there no safe foods? Does nothing kind of have a, you know, a crazy backstory? Yeah, you know, one of the big themes of the book is, is that there's a lot we don't know, right? So one of the things that I find fascinating you know, so we can laugh, we can go back and laugh and say, man, what were these th people thinking? They thought tomatoes were poisonous. They thought they summoned werewolves. They thought potatoes caused syphilis and leprosy. That, that sounds like they were ridiculous, right? But here it is, it's, it's 2021. And our, our top scientists can't decide whether or not eggs are good for us. Um, you can you can go to the library or the bookstore and you can find very smart people who have written books on nutrition and you can find people who say eggs are the best thing for us and people or they're the, the worst thing for us or it, it really doesn't matter. Um, so there's a lot that we still don't know. Um, there's a lot we still don't know about about nutrition. It's pretty complex. Uh, and I, I get into that in in that chapter, right? There's a lot of lot of different factors uh, that are confusing. Um, and so you mentioned olive oil and fish, you know. So th those are are two of the, the 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 ones that probably get green lights the most, right? So most yeah. most not all, but most experts will agree that olive oil is healthy. Um, but you know that's only true if your olive oil is actually olive oil, and you know sadly, uh, you know adulteration is is an issue. Um, you know there there's a a huge black market uh, olive oil counterfeiting industry, and the same thing is going on for honey and a lot of other foods. And you know the good news is that we've come a long way. We we have a lot that's in place to, you know, sort of screen for these things. Um, odds are, you know, if you're in the United States, um, odds are if you're buying olive oil, uh, you know, most cases of counterfeit olive oil today have to deal with, you know, saying it's extra virgin when it's really not extra virgin or saying it's, it's comes from Italy when it was shipped to Italy from another country only so that it could say it was exported from Italy. Um, you know, fish is another one. I, I think in a vacuum, I think fish, you know, were probably super healthy in, in a vacuum before humans came along and filled the seas with microplastics and mercury. And so it's, you know, there's, in order to, in order to eat, you know, quote unquote healthy, I think there's some things that, frankly, no one knows and you have to decide which camp you're still in. Um, and there are other things that you, you're gonna have to do a lot of research and really look carefully at your labels. Uh, but I, I don't think we've, I, I, I'm not comfortable trusting food brands to uh, tell me what's healthy. I walked by a vending machine the other day. I, I love this. I walked by a vending machine um, and it, it, it had pictures of all sorts of fruits like printed on the vending machine. And it had these letters that said healthy snacks, good for you snacks. And the vending machine was just filled with soda and candy. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's sort of, you know, there's a lot of that going on in the grocery store. Yeah. Um, and not all of it is nefarious, right? So, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, you pull a fish out of the sea, you know, it's hard to, to tell some, sometimes what sort of fish it is, right? And certainly where it came from 
you know, so it's not always that uh, manufacturers are out to sort of dupe us. It's just that it's it's hard to trace exactly, you know, where our food came from and what it's been exposed to. Yeah. Um, the rebranding of fish that you talk about was really interesting. How the, what is it, the toothfish? No one was eating it, so it became the Chilean sea bass. Yeah, so Patagonian toothfish. <laughs> no, one, no one wanted to eat the Patagonian toothfish until it was cleverly rebranded uh, with a different name, Chilean sea bass. Uh, despite the fact that it's not technically a bass, uh, and a lot of the time it's not Chilean, um, <laughs> but it sounded like a more appealing name, and it worked. Now it sells for twenty nine ninety nine at Whole Foods, and is you know really popular uh, in restaurants. And so that's sort of a modern day example of you know the tomato. It, it was called you know the just like the tomato, uh, Chilean sea bass was was considered a, a trash fish inedible and gross and it was thrown back and considered worthless and now it's you know on, on the endangered by overfishing because it's so popular was your own eating and cooking influenced uh as you were as you were writing this i know we talked before about like wanting to snack in like the library of congress but i mean just your your daily habits and yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think the, the big thing is in the later chapters where I start to talk, you know, bring things more full circle to present day. Um, I'm a lot more skeptical about, about what I eat, right? You know, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a complex process, right? And today, you know, the, there's a lot we sacrifice in order for convenience, um, for having foods readily available and cheap. So yeah, I'm, you know, this is not a health book, uh, but I am very passionate about, about health. And uh, I think uh, the last chapter can sort of be used uh, as a starting point for some of the things to look for. But yeah, bottom line, I, uh, I'm very skeptical of, of labels and claims and even research studies, right? Because there's a lot of research studies you know, that if you actually read them, they're, you know, they're sponsored by these food companies and they don't actually, there's a lot of asterisks there, you know? Yeah. Um, so no, I don't trust my cereal to lower my cholesterol <laughs> <laughs> just because that's what it says. Um, oh gosh, I feel like there's, the, the, yeah, there's just so much to talk about with this book, but having an eye on the time, I would like to ask you just a couple of questions about the writing of it. Um, you know, uh, what topic here was the, uh, was the most difficult to research? You know, um, all of them were, were challenged to research. So I, you know, I took more than 100 pages of notes for every chapter before I started writing that chapter. Uh, so none of them were easy. I, I think the, you know, the hardest topic was, was probably a uh, a small anecdote about honey. So I have a chapter, an entire chapter on honey, and I just figured, you know, I couldn't cover thousands of years of honey in an entire chapter without just addressing the adage that you catch more bees with honey than vinegar, or catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Um, so I really figured that that would be just a short footnote. I figured like, hey, this is something I can find out in 20 minutes and just make a little parenthetical or footnote in the chapter that says, hey, by the way, that adage is true, or by the way, that adage is false. Um, but I couldn't find an answer. I, you know, I, I couldn't find anyone who had been curious about, you know, the, the, science, the science, whether or not that held up. So I ended up honestly probably spending a month talking to <laughs> different fly experts and reading different scientific papers on, you know, flies and finding these old, you know, diaries hundreds of years ago from, uh, from, you know, farmers who, who experimented with all these different substances to see which worked the best at eradicating flies. So that, that was unexpectedly probably my most difficult topic. And the, the short answer is it depends whether you catch uh, more flies with honey and vinegar depends on a host of crazy variables, everything from the 
uh, sex uh, and mating status um, of the fly to the, whether the last time they ate, the last time they drank, how thirsty they are, how, how well they've slept, the time of the day, the time of the season. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's way more in depth than I expected. That's, that's amazing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your kind of just the volume of like research and books? And I know that you are able to speed read. I imagine that that came in very helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned, you know, I mentioned I took, you know, at, at, for every chapter, I took at least 100 pages of notes before I started writing the chapter. Um, and I used to be an English professor, as we mentioned, and I did teach a speed reading course. So that helped. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I think my research really started before I wrote this book. So I didn't, you know, I, I've always loved food and I was passionate about writing about food, but I, I didn't sit down and say, hey, I know I want to write a chapter about honey. I know I want to write about ice cream. I just, my nights and weekends before I intentionally, deliberately decided to write a book, I just would spend my nights and weekends just checking out duffel bags of books from the libraries and, you know, going on databases and going down these rabbit holes, just researching foods. And, you know, after a couple of years of doing that, I just really sat down and I wrote, uh, I'd written down everything that I thought was interesting. And I just looked at hundreds and hundreds of note cards and just covered my whole house and just tried to think, all right, what are the what are the common connections here? You know, I've got this part about ice cream during World War II. I've got Howard Johnson, you know, I've got honeybees over here. Um, you know, what, what are the common threads? And, and then, uh, you know, I was able to put an outline of the book together. And then I really started my research all over and said, all right, now I know what I want to write about. Now let's dive even deeper. So I spent a lot of times in, you know, university libraries, Library of Congress archives, speed reading. So there must be a lot that didn't make it into the book. Just, there must be tons. Yeah, no, there's a lot that, uh, there's a lot that didn't make it into the book. You know, I tried to keep, you know, you, you can't write about everything, right? If, the, if we were to truly write the history of food or the secret history of all foods, you know, it would be thousands of pages long. Um, so I tried to boil these down to chapters that don't just talk about one food, but that, you know, reveal a lot about um, the way that food and humans sort of co-evolved together, right? And, and reveal a lot about, you know, the reasons we eat and, and the effects, the relationship between, between food and humans. Um, so there are a lot of great stories out there that just uh, they're interesting. To, they're interesting stories, but they they just sort of uh, didn't fit those narratives, or they you know they they really just sort of stuck out in you know in uh, in transitioning from chapter to chapter, or you know they didn't add anything. So yeah, I had to cut a lot that that you know hopefully will make its way to another book. Or Are you? Are, are you working on anything now or do you know what's next or you're still trying to figure it out? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm working on a few different book proposals. It's a lot of zigging and zagging, you know, so just like it was, you know, originally, um, I'm sure there are writers who do it much more efficiently than I do. But, you know, for me, I, I'm a lot of zigging and zagging and, and, and just trying to triangulate, you know, what's these are these are things that I, I think people would be interested in, and I'm certainly interested in them. What's you know, is there a way to to draw a straight line and and write a, write a chapter about them that, you know, where they come together? Well, so I hope so. I hope you know. I uh, that's my plan. You know, we'll see if I can make it work. Well, we definitely look forward to uh, to reading whatever comes next. Um, I guess we should see if there are any questions. Um, I actually see that Susie typed to the group chat, um, what would be left in the markets without corn? That is a whole chapter. 
Yeah, that's a whole chapter. Um, nothing. I mean, really, you know, so I get pretty deep in this into the book, but corn is an ingredient in not only most, if not all of the foods we eat, but also an industrial ingredient in, in the packaging of those foods and the inks on those packaging and the, you know, the paper that's, and the ink that are printed on your receipt. Um, corn is, you know, it's an industrial ingredient in almost everything, not just foods, but everything from, you know, aspirin to pan coatings to ceiling tiles. The original so, corn you talk about in the book was tiny, like the size of a cigarette, you say, with like only a few kernels. It was super hard. Yeah. So corn, we know, you know, corn today is this, this, staple that you know much of the world depends on and an ear of corn has hundreds of you know soft kernels uh but initially the, the early ancestor of corn uh looked nothing like corn it was uh, an entire ear of it would have been about the size of a cigarette and it would have had maybe six or eight kernels on it which were way smaller than today's kernels and more importantly, rock hard and just wrapped in this almost impenetrable casing. So we're really not even sure what the first people who ate corn did with it. Probably they, they ground it and uh, you know made sort of a tortilla out of it. Um, but for whatever uh, reason, they saw potential in what was essentially a, a weed that didn't offer you know, a lot of uh, calories or nutrition and they kept replanting it, sort of like we talked about earlier with peppers. They kept replanting it, uh, planting only the seeds uh, that they that had the traits they liked most, which in that case was things like size and tenderness and disease resistance. And over hundreds and thousands of years, we just transformed corn from that uh, almost inedible weed into you know a, a giant world staple. Um, are there are there any other questions, uh, Carolyn? Or I find the history of food to be absolutely fascinating, and it's um, and you you talked about with the importance of warfare. I mean, you know, if you read about the Romans, you know, they they sowed salt into the soil in Carthage so that it would no longer be able to become a powerful kingdom again and threaten Rome. And there's the story that Cato held up a fig, I think it was, and said, this fig, I think, was picked in Carthage two days ago, indicating how close it would be, Carthage in North Africa, how close it would be to, for Carthaginian army to invade Southern Italy. And so I, I think the history of food is fascinating. I also think that it's interesting, the people who came to the United States and how, um, how they farmed and what they brought with them. And I, I remember reading, um, I mean, this sounds really <laughs> absurd. Why? Little House on the Prairie. Does everybody remember Little House on the Prairie that when you were a child, right? And they talk about how rare white flour was. And that's what they used was cornmeal because they lived on isolated farms. And there's not like in Europe where you could take your wheat to a mill that was in a neighboring town and have it ground. And that was expensive. So what you lived on day to day was cornmeal. I mean, I'm, you may know more about this than I do, but that has always struck me as something interesting. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, adding another layer on that is, you know, this is, this is a big country, right? And so, um, you know, you've got, it, it's not just one story. You've got all these different narratives unfolding, you know, at different times, you know, certain crops are, more prominent here than they are there. You've got corn over here. You've got chilies over here. Um, so yeah, it's really uninteresting to see how everything sort of unfolded and came together. There were parts of the United States which were not like the wheat fields in the west of Canada, which until the Ukrainian farmers came over were not farmed because they were the ones who knew how to do it. How 
to farm that kind of land. And that, of course, changed eating habits. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot, a lot to get into with food, right? This, this book, um, it is certainly not a complete history, right? It's the, the by calling it the secret history, this, you know, for me, it's the, the, the little known, um, really things that have been lost or, or forgotten. Um, but yeah, there's huge, I mean, we, you know, these are all things that, that certainly entire books have been written about, um, you know, things like the spice trade and, you know, the, the advent of agriculture and farming and, you know, uh, fermentation. I mean, there's, there's just so many milestones that, that have changed, uh, have changed, you know, everything about humans. And, and that's something we really haven't talked about, but, you know, the book really gets into, especially the first few chapters, the impact of food, you know, on, on humans, not just socially and economically and industrially, but psychologically and physically, you know, foods, they physically changed our bodies. They gave us smaller jaws and larger brains and smaller stomachs. And it, it's really fascinating, you know, how humans and food co-evolved together, just as we, you know, just as we bred these different foods to, um, you know, have traits that we liked, you know, like size and tenderness and sweetness and, and spiciness, food changed us in, in ways that benefited food. Such as? You know, so food changed us in a lot of ways that uh, benefited, you know, us, right? So the advent of cooking is one of the big, uh, you know, the advent of fire is one of the big game changers, obviously, in humanity. But if you focus just on cooking, cooking just did so much for humans. Um, you know, it, it uh, made uh, food much safer to eat, for one. Um, made uh, it a lot easier to keep foods longer, right? By cooking them or drying them or smoking them. Um, but it also made foods a lot more digestible. So if you think about something like a raw potato, raw potato, it's, it's one, it's not very pleasurable or easy to eat if you don't cook it, right? But it's also, it's not very digestible or nutritious. Um, so when we start, and a lot of foods, you know, are to we're toxic without cooking them, right? Um, so if you put all that together, the advent of cooking just allowed humans to get so much more calories and nutrients out of foods. Um, and, you know, that really changed our bodies, right? That the, the, the brain is, is very expensive uh, metabolically. So, you know, uh, the advent of cooking allowed, you know, the, the body to fuel the brain, to really grow our brains. And it allowed the rest of our body to sort of shrink to accommodate that. So we didn't need these massive jaws anymore to, you know, chomp on, on these raw foods. So our, our bodies just became much more streamlined and efficient due to cooked foods. That's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. <laughs> Any other questions? You, you don't need to put them into chat at this point. You can simply unmute yourself and ask them if you have any. Did you, Heather, I'm sorry. I think you asked him about his next project. You haven't really, are you going to do something with food? I, for, I think I forgot what you said. I hope so, yeah. So I'm working on a few different, uh book projects, nothing's ready for market yet, but I have a lot more stories to tell and I'd certainly have a passion to tell them. So yeah, I, uh, you know, that's my plan is, is to, uh, is to put out another book about food. We've also had some interest in, uh, in TV for this, you know, and turning this into, you know, from filmmakers and documentaries. So, you know, I, I'd love to uh, explore adaptations for that too. So fingers crossed on both those fronts. Wow, that's wonderful. Good for you. So 
if we have no other questions, I'm going to thank Matt and thank Heather and Kathleen and Susie and, and um, Martin Wilson from HarperCollins who helped set this up for coming and everybody for coming and please join us at our other um, events that are, and Matt, you can come too because it's all by Zoom, okay? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Again, I wish, I wish we could have done this in person. I think we all do, but uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, I uh, pet pet psychics. I think I'll be there for that event. <laughs> oh, good. Well, it's not by Zoom, though. Oh, that one I'll have to miss. No, unfortunately, <laughs> that's that's going to be in person on Sunday. But but uh, somebody can report back to you on what it is. Okay. <laughs> okay thank you very much, everybody. Great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Heather. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.